Welcome, everyone, to our CLE Today, the evolution of college sports law, SCOTUS, and beyond. My name is Daniel Lust. I'm one of the hosts of the Conduct Detrimental Sports Law Podcast. I am a practicing attorney in New York. I am also the sports law professor at New York Law School. Today, I'm joined by two of my team members over on Conduct Detrimental, where we cover everything at the intersection of sports and law. First, Taryn Sharma, a recent graduate of Minnesota Law School. Taryn, how's it going? Hey, Dan, doing well. Uh, yeah, recent as recent can be. I just graduated from the University of Minnesota Law School this past Saturday. Uh, I'll be uh, taking a position at a Minneapolis-based firm, practicing M&A and corporate work there uh, upon passing the bar. And um, I'll also be teaching our brand new sports and NIL clinic class at the University of Minnesota Law School this fall. Very exciting. And sitting next to you virtually is Brendan Duggan, a recent, oh, we'll say you recently finished your 1L year at Brooklyn Law School. So, uh, Brendan, pleasure to, pleasure to have you here. Yeah, really excited to be here. Uh, I'm a rising 2L at Brooklyn Law School. I was a previous uh, student athlete myself. I played volleyball at NYU, and I also worked at Overtime while I was in college, a sports media company. And I'm really excited to be here and talk everything NIL and college sports law today. So, um, you know, the reason, uh, so I, I guess I'm the elder statesman in the room being uh, the ripe old age of, of 34. Um, we, we thought it was important to have a younger, um, you know, some younger presenters for this particular topic because the, the world of college sports is changing in a way that it's never, we've never really seen before. So the next 100 years of college sports are actually being shaped right now in the state legislatures and maybe even the federal government, maybe Congress. Um, and, you know, for you know roughly 100 years, college sports was was backed on this thing called amateurism, which was this concept that um, athletes did not and should not be paid because we wanted to preserve their amateur status and they, we wanted to protect their educational rights and not make them seem like professional athletes. That is being turned on its head as we speak. So Taryn, Brendan, uh, certainly going to be a lot of fun today to break that down. Now, before we get into it, uh, Brendan, you said you played volleyball. I can confirm you are a, a very tall individual. We, what do we say? We want to say six, seven? Yeah, six, seven. If, if we were doing this in person, I think people would say, like, oh, obviously, like, I played, played sports at some level. Um, did you make any money during your time playing volleyball at NYU? I did not, and I could not. Um, cause I was going to say that was a trick question because if you did, you would be in prison, you would be in sports law jail because for again, 100 years of college sports, that was not allowed. And now very much a uh, different world, uh, athletes, our top athletes are making eight figures. Uh, so it's not a fake number. It's a real number. Um, and we have boosters paying people above the table, maybe some still beneath the table, but, uh, everything's trying to be brought above board. So Damn. our agenda today, we're going to try to go over those past 100 years. We're going to look forward into the next 100. Taryn, were you saying something? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, imagine if this was all an elaborate ruse to, uh, bring down former NYU volleyball player, Brendan Duggan, that we had set this entire thing up to get him to cop to taking, uh, money while he was playing. Um, listen, we, we know that still you can be punished retroactively. So, Brendan, just uh, everything you say can and will be used against you in the court of sports law. Okay. Uh, Taryn, let me hand it over to you. Let's talk um, a little bit about what we plan to cover today. A lot of, uh, we said 100 years, previous 100 years, next 100 years. By my rough math, I was a philosophy major, not a math major. That's 200 years of content that we're going to try to get into in one tight hour. So, Taryn, I will hand it over to you. Yeah, absolutely. So for many years, the NCAA prohibited student athletes uh, from being compensated, like we mentioned, because of their so-called amateur status. Uh, in this course, we examine landmark cases that look closely at the NCAA and their involvement in potential antitrust violations. We also look ahead to the future of college athletics within this new name, image, and likeness era. Okay. And, you know, on that, obviously what we try to do, um, again, a lot here, but we try to go over our objectives. So Brendan, our, our uh, junior member in the room, give us our learning objectives. And we'll be teaching you the class today because obviously maybe you were taking some hypothetical money while you were playing uh, NYU volleyball. No, I'm just kidding. But let's, let's go over what our audience should learn today, our learning objectives. For sure. We have three real learning objectives today. Um, today, we're going to take a step back and look 
back to examine the background and history of the NCAA's legal battles. And as part of the history of the NCAA, we're going to explore the definition and concept of amateurism, a term that has remained extremely important. And lastly, we're going to look ahead and consider the future landscape of college athletics, and particularly the future of NIL, which, as Taryn mentioned, the name, image, and likeness era in college sports.